Hello everyone, I'm Kate Jones. I'm a history teacher and head of history at an amazing British curriculum school here in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. I was actually meant to be speaking at Research Ed Surrey when the event was first launched because my plan was to be in the UK during October half term, but clearly uh, 2020 events have changed that. But nevertheless, I'm still really excited to be presenting today. And something that I've written a lot about, I've read a lot about, is retrieval practice. So I thought I would focus my presentation today on the context of retrieval practice in 2020, with all the challenges that we are facing. And where I wanted to start off was actually with a quote from Paul Kirshner. We're in a war zone at the moment. We're not doing our best to save lives, but to save learning and save children. And this just really struck a chord with me because it doesn't matter if you're an NQT, if you've been teaching for 10 years like I have, or if you're a head teacher. This situation is new to us all. It's uncertain times. We've really got to support each other and just share what is working or perhaps what doesn't work well. We're all in this together. And I'm a big fan of Paul Kirshner, his books, his blogs, his academic research. If you're not familiar with his work, then please do check that out. So a little bit of advice from me, because quite a lot of people have said to me, I haven't got time for retrieval practice. I've got to catch up. I've got so much content we've got to get through. We're worried about exams that are taking place. And of course, I understand that I'm a teacher. I feel those same pressures. But we know retrieval practice is an effective teaching and learning strategy. The research behind retrieval practice is overwhelming. And not just the research, but teacher experience, outcomes. Any teacher who's embraced retrieval practice will probably be able to tell you about the positive impact it's had on their practice. We know this works, so why would we resort to strategies that are not as effective? And it might be easier in remote learning to say, go and find out this online and create a presentation about it, but we know that's not as effective. Also during remote learning, when there's been an absence of the teacher and lessons have been disrupted, there's probably lots of content that students might not have grasped in the same way. Uh, there might be misconceptions, misunderstandings, and retrieval practice will allow the teacher and the student to identify where those gaps are in the knowledge. So in terms of knowledge, we can close the COVID gap through retrieval practice by finding out what students know and what they don't know. So it's a great long-term strategy and we need to avoid thinking, oh, I can't do retrieval practice. I've got so much to get through. We need to make time for retrieval practice in our lessons, whether that is in the classroom or in a Zoom classroom. So I've created this. I realize you might not be able to see the top box. Um, this could include probably a lot more factors, but I thought, what are the key aspects that we need for the green box says reduce disruption to learning in 2020 in a global pandemic? And if we have all the factors across the top, then that could minimize the negative impact on teaching and learning. But if we remove any of those factors, it, there could be a negative impact. So obviously I started off with the retrieval practice. As I've said, that's incredibly important. Communication between teachers and students and parents. The access to resources, and this varies greatly. Obviously, I'm in a very fortunate position in Abu Dhabi at my school. All students have a Google Chromebook. Teachers have one. We've been trained up, so we do have access to fantastic resources. But I know this is not the case in a lot of schools in the UK, that there's some issues and challenges. Um, student effort and motivation is always important, but learning from home brings with it lots of new challenges. Um, the distractions that are around, uh, the engagement in a lesson it definitely will be impacted. Support and well-being, well, COVID-19, that is you know, having a physical impact on many people, but we can't neglect the mental impact it's having on lots of people. Whether they've been affected or not directly with COVID, 
it, it, is, it is having a negative impact on the mental health of a lot of people. So support and wellbeing, that is everyone in the community. We need to look after our head teachers and senior leaders and as they're trying to support teachers and middle leaders, and we need to support the children and their parents as best we can. Obviously, instruction and feedback are really important components of teaching and learning, and they should be with remote teaching and learning. And attendance can be a big barrier and challenge anyway, but now throw this all into the mix, attendance can be problematic. And if we have dips in attendance, which could be the students just not actually participated in remote lessons, or maybe they have been ill, um, then that will lead to gaps in their knowledge. And that links back to the retrieval practice where we need to identify those gaps and fill those gaps. If there's a lack of instruction and feedback from the teacher, there could be a lack of clarity as to where to go next and how to progress for the student. If we don't have that network of support and well-being isn't considered, that can lead to increased anxiety all round. And we know there's, there's a lot of research that says that stress and anxiety can have a negative impact on memory, on focus and concentration. Retrieval practice, whilst there's not a lot of research in this area, there is some research that says regular retrieval can actually reduce anxiety and nerves when it comes to high stakes exams. Then if we think about effort and motivation, and if the students are just disengaged and not trying, that's really frustrated for us and they will probably underperform. And from my own experience throughout this year, I have seen two ends, um, basically, on one end of the spectrum, we've had students who, who are usually um, very attentive in class and they are highly motivated but outside of the classroom context, they've really struggled and they've really struggled with organization and motivation. Whereas other students on the other end have absolutely flourished during remote learning, that they've taken this opportunity to perhaps not have the usual distractions they would have in school, to take more time. And it's just really, it's been really interesting to see the different ways that remote learning has affected different students. Now, if we don't have access to resources, this is really difficult, isn't it? This is really quite sad as well. You know, there will be students who, who won't have laptops, who won't have Wi-Fi, and we do need to make sure that we have to cater for everyone. Even in my school where everyone has Chromebooks, there will be days where there's um, at home perhaps four children all carrying out remote learning, and perhaps they, you know, there's Wi-Fi issues or the Wi-Fi isn't that great. But generally, I am referring to cases in the UK where we don't want to see a disadvantage gap or that disadvantage gap widen because of a lack of resources. And if there isn't regular communication between teachers and parents and obviously between students, then there can just be this general confusion. It might lead to other things like the anxiety, like the lack of clarity as well. So communication is key. And then finally, if we're not using retrieval practice, then we'll be resorting to strategies that we know don't work as well. We know retrieval practice, it works, so let's stick with it. So a great uh, tweet actually from Daniel Willingham, you might be familiar with him. He's got a great series, Ask the Cognitive Scientist. And this uh, tweet, I'll just give you a moment to read, is about the context of research. And some teachers who are critical of educational research say, well, that's all very well and said and done, but those experiments and studies were carried out in labs, come into my classroom. There has been a movement in recent years for research to take place in classrooms. And there are research papers that have looked at the testing effect in a classroom context. But the point Daniel Willingham is making, and rightly so, is saying that we should be careful of anyone using the, you know, claiming, well, research shows we should do this because this is an entirely new context as well. So even though I will be talking about research today, none of the research I am referring to, it was explicitly written about a pandemic situation. It's just about how I've taken that research and adapted it to a classroom context myself. So 
Henry Mark Green, why are you starting with something from the 80s? And this is before I was born as well. Um, but I wrote about this in my first book. And I think the TPAC model is more important now than it's ever been. And I just thought I'll, I'll tell you the evolution of this model in case you're, you're not familiar with it. So Lee Shulman wrote a fantastic paper. And in this paper he wrote with his colleagues, he wrote about the frustration about at the start of the 20th century, teachers were constantly tested on their content knowledge. That's the green circle. Um, constantly drilled to make sure that they knew their subject inside out, which of course we do expect our teachers to have that. But pedagogy was neglected and how they communicate that, their subject knowledge to students, it wasn't even considered. But then in the 80s, by the time Shulman was writing this, it was all about the pedagogy and the tasks and the activities and subject knowledge had just been disregarded, which clearly we don't want that either. That's not a good thing. So he said that teachers need to have this strong pedagogical knowledge and strong content knowledge of their subject and hence the Venn diagram and the sweet spot in the middle. Now, the TPAC model built on that, but added another dimension and said teachers also need strong technological knowledge. I realize that is missing there. Um, and actually, Mishra and Colwell wrote this in 2007, where we probably weren't using technology that much. I don't even know, perhaps interactive whiteboards maybe, but this really does apply to remote learning. A teacher can have strong subject knowledge, strong pedagogical knowledge, They've got to know how the technology works so that they can ensure students have access to resources so they can communicate with students so they can give feedback. It's absolutely crucial. So if a teacher feels that they are lacking in that knowledge or confidence, then it really is up to the school to support them. And the teacher as well can do something about it themselves to develop their technological knowledge. Now, Mishra and Kola, added an outer circle to the TPAP model, which was all about context. And again, context is key. I've talked about my situation in Abu Dhabi. There are some schools that are Apple schools, Microsoft, um, some where there's bring your own device or where they already have devices. So we have to figure out remote learning within our own context and what we've got available to us. Now, Building on this, I developed the TPAC, <laughs> the double C model that I wrote about in Love to Teach. And I added cognitive knowledge because whilst a lot of the research isn't new, if we think about Ebbinghaus in 1885, for example, it's becoming now mainstream to teachers whereas it wasn't previously. This knowledge how students learn cognitive science and psychology, there's been a real interest in this in recent years, and it's now become uh, more available to teachers because of books, because of research ed. Um, the gap between research and the classroom is closing. So we need to combine our knowledge and understanding of how students learn with our subject knowledge, our pedagogical knowledge, and our technological knowledge we need to do that anyway, but especially during remote or hybrid blended learning. So I'm going to talk about multiple choice questions for retrieval practice, because I think they're a great strategy to use. But I'm going to start off just let's have a little look at some genuine questions that I found online. Right. Who was Ebert? Now, if I asked you who was Friedrich Ebert, the history teachers would probably know, but um, a lot of people probably wouldn't know that he was the first president of the Weimar Republic. But I guarantee you'd be able to answer that question correctly because the other two options, the distractors as they're known, they're ridiculous. It's just, there's no recall needed in that. It is simply power of elimination. And you'd be surprised how many questions there are like that out there. I mean, I won't go into depth with the next one, but a GCSE question, English literature, Can you see why I put the face palm in? Who did Romeo love? Well, come on. But I'm, I'm sure people will probably put your mom just for the, for the lols. 
but it's like, okay, I understand. Perhaps we're trying to have a laugh and, and be the cool teacher, but we need to take multiple choice questions seriously in order for them to be an effective retrieval practice strategy, which I'm sure most teachers do, but there's a lot of this out there. So what are the pros and cons of multiple choice questions? There's probably a lot more, but I'm just gonna talk about what I consider the main ones to be. And the first one is that there's opportunities for retrieval success, and we need to get the level of challenge right. It needs to be desirable. Um, it, there should be a level of challenge there. It should be difficult, but we need to promote opportunities for success as well. And the multiple choice questions are great for that. So younger students, students with additional learning needs, retrieval practice has been, the research says you should use it with all students, regardless of their age and ability, but multiple choice questions lend themselves well to all students and all subjects. Also, I touched upon misconceptions, misunderstandings, um, these might occur as a result of remote learning. So we can perhaps use the options, the distractors of a multiple choice question to try and figure this out and try to understand or to see what students know and what they don't know and what they can recall. And also there's so many options um, in regards to so these two points linked together um, in regards to technology with multiple choice questions and they are really workload friendly for teachers. They can mark the quizzes instantly so the teacher doesn't have to. There's pre-quizzes that you can already use or like quizzes you can take questions and adapt them. And then you've got a quiz that is personalized but hasn't taken you long to create. Because I do think question design is the hardest part with a multiple choice question. Um, and as I said, it's one strategy we should use. Tom Sherrington always says, when it comes to retrieval practice, vary the diet. And I really like that. Provide opportunities for verbal and written retrieval for multiple choice and free recall. But a student in the secondary class could be going from lesson to lesson to lesson, kahoot, 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 <laughs> where there's lots more other options that will provide multiple choice quizzes, not just kahoot. So yeah, mix it up. So what are the cons? Oh, so, well, this one, yeah, as we've seen with the questions I shared with you, if the questions and the options are not designed well, then it's a wasted retrieval opportunity. And we need to think more carefully about that. There's also the opportunity for guesswork here, which is really difficult. How, how do we to know as a teacher if a student was able to recall it or the, they guessed it? There are things we can do. Um, we can do confidence rankings where students um, rank their answers or their levels of confidence, but there could always be that element of guesswork with multiple choice. Um, another problem is that students don't reflect on their answers. They, if they've answered 15 questions, they might look at their score, 13 out of 15, but then not, not checked where they went wrong. So they know there's gaps in their knowledge, but they haven't identified them explicitly, which they should do. Um, and then finally, this is not really a con, but we shouldn't become too reliant on multiple choice. Linking back to what I said, we must provide opportunities for free recall. Free recall is harder. It's more effortful. It requires, uh, it will require more recall, but it's more effective. So we need to balance those strategies out. So there we go. I'm sure perhaps you can think of some more pros and cons, but despite the balance of pros and cons there, I do think we should use multiple choice questions. So here's some tips from some research from my own experiences. Avoid using none of the above or all of the above. And this is from a research paper um, that I'll talk about in a moment. And I did used to use all of the above quite a lot. And I thought this was a clever way of checking if the students had checked and read the question carefully. But actually, it seems like we're trying to trip up the students and catch them out. And what if all of the answers are above and a student, uh, all the answers above are correct and a student has selected B and it comes back as incorrect? Well, it's not incorrect. It's just not the answer that you're looking for. So that could cause more confusion. And the reason about none of the above so why have we then asked the students a question where we haven't given them the correct answer, but just expose them to incorrect answers? And again, probably causing more confusion. So just, yeah, leave that. 
Um, also, yeah, don't include too many options. I've seen some multiple choice questions where there's, you know, there's six to eight options. That's way too many. Um, three is, is what the research paper that I'll refer to suggested, but three plausible, because by the time you put in a comedy, jokey, silly one, then you're narrowing it down. And then the more we're narrowing it down, it could potentially be a 50-50 or they can just figure it out from power of elimination. So it's those distractors, those plausible options that we need to think about. Um, also time. So a lot of digital multiple choice quizzes have timers on. And I like quizzes because you can edit the timer or you can remove the timer. And I understand why teachers might include a timer because they might have planned so much amount of their lesson for retrieval and they perhaps don't want it to go over, which is what can happen a lot with retrieval practice. It can hijack your lesson. Um, but the problem with a timer is that when the clock is ticking, that can put pressure on the students and a low stakes quiz might become slightly high stakes quiz. And I remember when I was doing a Kahoot quiz and you got more points for answering quickly and I was mortified I got the answer wrong. It was so easy. I think the question was, which of these is the flag of England? And even though I'm Welsh, I know that, but I just didn't read the question and I just clicked quickly and then I was embarrassed and I felt stupid. So the timer encourages people to, to rush and make mistakes. Also question design. So if you're creating a knowledge organizer, we, we can't put everything on a knowledge organizer. We have to think carefully, what, we will, what will we include? And actually, what will we leave out? And that approach, what do students really need to know? We can apply that when it comes to quizzing. So I saw a question on a quiz that asked about um, the year Henry VII was born. Now, I wouldn't actually ask my students that because I don't think they really need to know that. I think what would be more significant and important and more useful for them to know would be what year Henry VII came to the throne. So it's thinking about what is it we want our students to know and not just asking questions probably for the sake of it. Um, a less is more approach can work well. And if we have less questions, that means more time to read the questions and the options carefully and more time for meaningful reflection and feedback where you as a class can discuss, where students can look back over their answers. Because if we have a lot of questions and then we might say, right, okay, look at your score, let's move on. So take a less is more approach and, and give more time uh, and attention to the questions that we have asked. Yeah, so try lots of different ones. I'm going to suggest quite a few. Um, if you haven't tried them all, just try it and, and see what you think. Okay, so um, further reading about multiple choice questions. Dawn Cox is one of my favorite teacher bloggers. She's an RE teacher, but her blogs are useful regardless of your subject. And she's written a great blog specifically about multiple choice questions. Blake Harvard is also brilliant. He's in America. He's done a lot of work on multiple choice questions, a lot of different strategies, a lot of different techniques. And he's based this on research um, so definitely check out his Twitter account and blog. The research paper that I was referring to when uh, I was talking about some of them tips was this by Andrew Butler. Um, it's a really good article. It's just sort of some do's and don'ts and explains why. And Elizabeth Bjork, there's a lot of research papers uh, that she's worked on in regards to multiple choice testing and quizzing. Um, but this one with Jerry Little, I found particularly interesting. And um, this is free to access online as well. So digital tools, and um, the one in the top corner, you might not be able to see is Jamboard. So I sort of have a criteria for when it comes to using online quizzing tools. Uh, the first one being, will it definitely be a low stakes quiz? Because that's what retrieval practice should be. If so, great. Second, will it support my workload? If it's going to add a lot to my workload, no thanks. Thirdly, is it easy to use for both me as a teacher and for the students? And when I go onto a website, and there have been a few that I haven't included here because someone recommended it to me, I went onto the website 
And I just couldn't navigate it. I couldn't figure it out. And if I can't do that in a few minutes, then I just give up and I can't be bothered because what I don't want is to be in a lesson where the focus is trying to figure out how a website works. Nope, we haven't got time for that. We want to get straight to the questions. So all of these are really user friendly for the teacher and the student. Um, lots of these, I think actually all of them will provide opportunities. Yeah, they do for either multiple choice or free recall. And some of them, you can allow both. So I'm just going to talk about three of my favorites. Um, and quizzes, I've written a blog about this that I'll tweet out. It's on my website, love to teach 87com I think this is fantastic. Here's a screenshot of um, an overview of a, uh, a class result. And it's great because you can see individuals, but then you can look at it from a class perspective. So if you look at question one, that was clearly very difficult. Only two people got that correct in comparison to question two. So it's really useful, but it's easy to use and navigate. It's free. There is an option to upgrade if you wanted to, but loads of amazing features. The teleport feature allows you to look at other quizzes, take their questions, teleport it over to yours, edit, amend it. You can add uh, um, polls, equations, images, loads of great things. The thing I like most about quizzes is how you can personalize it. If you want to keep the leaderboard, you can. If you want to remove it, you can. The same with music, timers, all of those features you can highly personalize. And it gives the teacher a lot of power and control, which I like. Um, and then the next one is a really exciting quizzing tool, Carousel Learn. So if you've used Retrieval Roulette, it's an incredibly popular retrieval activity that was designed by Adam Boxer. This is a, a website version of it. It's had loads of great feedback. There's opportunities for question banks for subjects to collaborate together. It's just a really, really clever website. Um, please do check that out. I'm going to go really quick because I'm mindful of the time. Mentimeter is no stakes. So students just go to menti.com, type in the code. It could be free recall, multiple choice. Um, it can be linked to vocabulary and create a word cloud, but they don't need to put their name in. You can't see individual names. So it's just good for a snapshot of the class. And it's quite good at the moment with remote learning. In my classroom, we have, well, in Abu Dhabi, we have to wear masks. So it's difficult for the class question and answer discussion, but Mentimeter is, has been has proven useful for that. So something I said that I wasn't doing much of was reflecting and giving enough time to feedback. So I very quickly created this Google Doc. And this is one that a student completed after completing a retrieval grid. What are they confident with? What were they able to easily retrieve? And where were the gaps in their knowledge? This is what you know, this is what you don't know. This is useful for the student, they can go away and act on that. It's also very useful for the teacher to see as well. And then, then final thoughts, Jerry Springer style. Um, so this is about long-term memory, a quote from the Bjorks, uh, about our capacity is just with long-term memory is just incredible, but the context and the conditions of when a student can retrieve information, that is a little bit more complex and that is something that I've been reading a lot of, about um, lately and I'll be talking about in the future, which links me in to my final point, my big announcement. Um, and you might see it already on there. I've authored two books already that you can buy. Um, one, Retrieval Practice, all about retrieval. And then I've got a new book coming out, which is Retrieval Practice 2. And it is a follow up. So it doesn't go over the basics of working memory and the benefits because that's covered in my first book. This takes it a step further about implementing, embedding and reflecting on retrieval practice in the classroom. There's contributions from leading academics like Paul Kirshner, Dylan Willem, Bjork and Bjork. And so many amazing teachers have also contributed to this book as well. I am so excited. So the date hasn't been announced yet. Um, I will post that when I know more information to follow. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And there's my information below if you were.